Good morning. I'm so glad to see you this morning. Thank you for joining us. The book of Psalms, of course, is the songbook of the Bible, but it's the eighth psalm that I'm thinking of this morning. It says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. And then it goes on to say, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've ordained, what is man that you take thought of him? And the Son of Man, that you care for Him. Yet you've made Him a little lower than God, and you crown Him with glory and majesty. <clears throat> and then it finishes up with, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is Your name in all the earth. So lest we begin to think, well... God has made us above all the other creation. We must remember that it's Him who is majestic above all the earth. Let's stand and sing, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is Your name. Father, we come before You with our offerings of praise because You indeed are the most majestic name in all the earth. We praise You for the creation that You've given us to enjoy, but we're reminded that You are the God of the universe, that You're sovereign, that You're the sustainer of this universe. And so we come to You to praise You today Thank you for the opportunity to gather in freedom. Thank you for the time that we'll spend together singing, for the time that we'll spend together in prayer. Most importantly, Father, thank you for the time that we'll gather around your word. I pray for our pastor this morning that you'll give him a boldness to speak, that you'll help him to share with us the words that you would want him to share, but that you would help us to hear to listen, to receive, to know that we have heard your voice. So I pray your blessings on our time together, and I pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> well, I've been informed that some of our information cards may be missing from the pew rack, so you may have to look for them. Uh, we had Bible school last week. So they may be in places different than usual. But if you look around, I think you'll be able to find one. And these are especially for those of you who are not members of First Baptist Church. 
if you would do us the honor of filling out some information just so that we'll know that you were here and we can use that as a record of your attendance and then you can use that as your offering for when you leave this morning if you'll leave it there on your pew or put it in the offering plate by the doors as you go out we would appreciate that very much and on the back side of that card is a place for prayer requests so any of us members as well can use these cards so if you have prayer requests would you fill that out for us and give us the privilege to pray for you well once again it's great to see you this morning especially those who are visiting and especially those who have joined us by way of Facebook and we've kind of gotten in the habit of doing this and we'll continue as long as we have folks watching us on Facebook and that's as you stand would you wave to them and let them know that we're glad they're here as you stand to greet one another. For those of you that do not know me, my name is Angela Clifton, but I am best known as Jerry's wife. <laughs> and the truth is, I really prefer to be in the background behind Jerry, which why in my flesh I really don't want to be up here right now. But when the pastor asked me to share my testimony, the Lord brought to mind 1 Peter 3.15 which instructs us to always be ready to give the reason for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. So here I am. <laughs> now I will forewarn you that my testimony is not exciting one. In fact, it's probably boring, but you know, I figured if the Lord can use the weak and foolish things, he can certainly use the boring things to bring him glory. <sighs> so here it goes. <laughs> I am what you would call a spiritual turtle. I am slow, frustratingly slow learning anything of spiritual nature. So it seems that I have to learn and relearn and relearn the elemental things. And rather than a road to Damascus conversion, my spiritual journey is a slow, lifelong process. And I'm so grateful the Lord meets us exactly where we are. As a child, I enjoyed going to Sunday school and church, and honestly, I cannot even recall a time when I didn't know that Jesus is God's son, that he died for our sins, and that he saved me. And although I'm not sure that I was aware of it then, but it seems that I was willing to let Jesus be my savior, but I'm not convinced that I had surrendered to his lordship. As I grew older physically, I stayed a spiritual baby but by the time I was a young adult, I knew. I knew I had not surrendered to Jesus' lordship. I was living for myself. I was the one on the throne of my heart, and I was not living a God-honoring life. But all the while, the Lord kept wooing me to him, calling me to go deeper still. And don't you just love that about him? He will do anything to make us his 
even sacrificing his own son. Now, for some reason, in my weird, skewed view of the Lord, I thought that if I surrendered all of me to Jesus, that he would do something radical, like sending me off to Africa to be a missionary. And the truth is, my flesh did not, I wanted to live my life my way. And so the years passed. And then one day, when I was 25 years old, I simply just stopped fighting. I decided that I needed to be completely his, no matter the cost. And I can still remember sitting on my bed, listening to a Margaret Becker song, and just surrendering everything. And yes, I even told him I would go to Africa to be a missionary if he really, really wanted me to. I really did. I was scared. <laughs> but do you know what? He didn't send me to Africa. Go figure. You know. <laughs> Instead, just a short time after my surrender, he sent me Jerry to serve alongside him. <laughs> which I am convinced is a way more exciting adventure than ever going to Africa. So, so you know, at this point you would think, oh, everything's good, she's saved, woohoo. But it was actually at this point that I began to wage war in the fierce spiritual battle of my mind. I was bombarded with my thoughts, my fears, and my doubts. And the main one being, was I really saved or did I just think that I'm saved? The verses from Matthew 25 where the Lord says, depart from me for I never knew you strike fear into my very soul. And after much prayer, tears, and many long talks with Jerry, I chose to be rebaptized as a demonstration of my surrender to the, Jesus' Lordship. And I have to be honest with you, the spiritual battle of my mind, it continues. And sometimes, even now, those ugly doubts and fears, they rear their heads. And the Lord, but the Lord, the sweetest words there are, but the Lord. He always reassures me, sometimes through his word, sometimes through a song, a prayer, a message, and yes, even through some of you, by a comment or encouragement. He continually reassures me. Doggone it. <laughs> praise God, praise God. I'm his and he is mine. And do you know what's even more amazing? Despite all my foolish fears and doubts, the Lord God Almighty, the one that spoke everything into existence, chooses to use this turtle slow girl and her crazy wild man husband. And in the 32 years of our spiritual journey together, the Lord has graciously allowed us to serve and worship him alongside of each other. And even now, in this new season of life, it is our joy to serve alongside of you, our brothers and sisters. So in ending, I would challenge you that it does not matter whether your testimony is exciting or uneventful. We must be ready to share it. Because, you know, actually our testimony is not even about us. It is part of the Lord's magnificent story of redemption and love. Praise God, he uses all of us in his never-ending story to God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Sometimes we sing hymns and the hymn is over and I know that you think to yourself, what did that even mean? Well, we're about to sing one of those hymns that I think you need to pay attention to what it says because it has meaning. And so I'm going to tell you ahead of time because the first verse reminds us that Jesus provides the sweetness that we're seeking. And the second verse 
tells us that Jesus offers us the salvation that we need. And the third verse says that Jesus gives us the hope for which we search. And then the final verse points out that Jesus is the source of the true prize for which we long. So as you sing this hymn, would you pay attention to the words, Jesus, the very thought of thee with sweetness fills my breast. Let's sing together. Jesus, the
If you would remain standing and open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to be reading from Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 through chapter 2 verse 3 this morning. Starting in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, And to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work in which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Please pray with me. Jesus, we can look out beyond these walls at the sky, at the trees, at everything you have made. And it is good. This morning, we worship you as creator. We thank you for giving us life and for giving us purpose. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll speak through Brother Donnie as he comes up here in a few short minutes to to preach this word. And Lord, I pray that you would make clear to all of us in attendance today, to those of us watching on Facebook, what it is you would have us do as your church, the purpose that you have for us. Lord Jesus, continue to grow us, continue to change us, continue to challenge us. Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close 
Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our to be overcome by your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Lord. So good to see you today. Thanks for coming and joining with us. I'm the pastor of First Baptist Church, better known as Jerry's pastor. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Couldn't help it, Jerry. Couldn't help it. We are in the first chapter of Genesis, bled over this morning in the reading into the second chapter of Genesis. I am talking about what I'm calling foundational doctrines, things that are 
absolutely important for us to know and to nail down because everything that we believe will spring from this foundation that we are that we're building it seems as though that human beings have to explore as a child my brother and I explored every place that we went in military life my father was a career military man and it was one of the greatest things was going to a new place and exploring it to have great adventures of exploration is common to the experience of humans and one of the biggest exploration things that has happened ever in the history of the world happened within my lifetime and many of you as well in 1968 it was a hard year 1968 those of us who were alive back there kind of mark that year in our memory for a number of things the United States was torn by division like it often is in April of that year Martin Luther King was assassinated and in June of that year Robert Kennedy was assassinated it was especially turbulent year in our history riots all over the country one of the worst of them during the Democratic National Convention in Chicago tough time in the background of all of that of course was the civil rights movement and a very divisive war in Vietnam those of you who are alive in 68 remember it it was a it was an important year in my life there were a number of big things that happened for me but at the very end of that year one of the most important exploration events in man's history and humans history took place when in December of that year Apollo 8 flew to the moon Frank Borman Bill Anders Jim Lovell flew this capsule it was only the second time that an Apollo had had people inside of it when it flew and it was the first time ever that people got out of low earth orbit going to another place of course that time going to the moon we have not repeated that a whole lot since then. It's been a long time since anybody has gone to some other place in the universe. Can you imagine what it was like for those three men to know that at the moment of that rocket's explosion to send them out of Earth orbit, they were heading to another world? They had a quite eventful trip, but a successful trip. They got to the moon fired the rocket that would put them into orbit around the moon and there they orbited that thing ten times on the ninth time those of us who were alive at that period of time remember a most remarkable event when on Christmas Day those three men read the creation story Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 through 10 is what they read from that circuiting of the moon it was the most watched television broadcast ever up until that point where people all around the world listened to those men read the story of the creation, reading it while their capsule circuited the moon. I remember it. I remember it being a most remarkable thing even at that point. It, it, it's interesting to me how people going off trying to explore the creation discovered Genesis. <laughs> and here we are today exploring Genesis, and it seems to me that what we're going to discover even more deeply is God and our relationship with God. I've entitled this sermon, Exploring the Image of God, and that's basically what I want to do to explore that concept and kind of see where it may take us. I confess that more than likely parts of what I have to say this morning are going to be somewhat difficult to follow. I, I'm going to ask you to you know, screw up your attention and try not to watch the, the stained glass for a little while. But if you must, you must. Because part of it will be, I think, a little bit challenging as we think about the image of God and, and what that's going to mean. There are just those two verses there. There are several times in the Bible that the image of God and its companion word in these passage, the likeness and the image of God and the likeness of God are described. Those two words, by the way, seem to be synonymous in this verse 
Let us make man in our image, in the likeness of God. But we've looked at these doctrinal, these foundational doctrines in Genesis chapter 1. We have seen that God is, that He is real, and that God is the creator of all that's out there. And He created all that's out there out of nothing. We've also seen that the God who created this universe has purposed to show Himself to that which He has created. It is His intent to reveal Himself. Otherwise, we would never know. But He has made it His purpose to reveal Himself to us. So in His creation, we see some things about God. We, we pick up bits and pieces of it. We find that He is not a tame lion, but He is a good one. <laughs> For His creation demonstrates that, that He is good. And there is no eternal good and eternal evil that battle one another somehow. There is just the eternal God who is good and His creation that He made that is good. Now we will see in future Sundays that He made it with the capacity to take a turn. But at His creation, it was only good. And we have seen that the culmination of His creative process came about in His creation of humankind. That was the high point in all that He created, you and I. Not that we are majestic, as we heard. He is the one who is majestic. But of all of His creation, there is nothing like us. And that was His intent. And we finally saw that God intended to make us in such a way that we would relate to Him. And those are, that's about as far as we've come. Where I'm going today doesn't necessarily push very far beyond that, but it, I just felt it necessary with the weight of those passages to kind of bore down into that a little bit more. I found it important to do that. There are a lot of characters that are in this passage, but of course the three big ones that show up in verse 26 and then are going to be elaborated on in all of chapter 2. But there is God in this passage who is creating all of this, and there is a male and a female that He's created. Now I know there's all rest of creation, but we've gotten to that point in this creation story that these are the three main characters that we've got to deal with a little bit more deeply. More deeply. That's probably grammatically okay. Deeper still. So here's God. Here's God. The word for God that is there that we've seen on many occasions is the Hebrew word Elohim. So you're familiar with it. I even touched on it last Sunday. It's not so much that we need to learn Hebrew, but... The scripture, the Old Testament scripture was given to us in that language. And so from time to time, when we reach back into that and grab a piece and pull it out, it's for our good. So the word Elohim is pretty complicated in that it was, it took the basic word for God, which was El in that ancient language and in that culture. The Canaanites used El as well. But the I am, Elohim, the I am on the end, showed that it was the plural. Elohim was a plural, which your first thought would be, oh, doesn't that mean that there's multiple gods? Well, that's exactly what it didn't mean because the Hebrew people were insistent in their whole history that there was but one God. The great revelation of God to these people made it absolutely clear to them that flying in the face of every culture that there was in the world that believed in multiple gods, these people said there was only one God. And so even though all the way through the Old Testament, from chapter 1 of Genesis to the very last chapter of the Old Testament, the word, Elo, the word Elohim is used over and over and over and over. That plural, God with the plural on it, did not mean a plurality of gods, but just one God. So theologians, people who work on Scripture, try to think, well, why did they say it that way? And what did it mean to them? And 
They have various different ways that they explain it that we've talked about on occasion, that plural of majesty perhaps, or some other, the council, I talked about you, these things last week. There would be no Jewish friend that you would have today and no Jewish person who would have lived in those ancient times that would have said, well, the word Elohim is pointing toward the Trinity. None of them would have said so. And so for us to read the word Elohim and say, well, it means Trinity, we've got to be careful. What I said last week was it's hinting towards, and I, I think that is true, but it's not the only hint. In these early passages that we have read and that we've talked about, we have seen a God who is hinted at as being quite complex. I used that word last week too. And you may have never just sat there in your seat eating your breakfast cereal and thought, well, God is kind of complex, isn't He? That wasn't your typical way of thinking about it, but that's the word I've given to you today. God is quite complex, and it's hinted at in a variety of ways in these early verses in chapter 1. For we have God, the very first thing, there it is, in the beginning God created Elohim. In the beginning, God created. And then it immediately throws this little curve at us concerning God where it says the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. And we as Christians immediately kind of, oh, Spirit of God, well, that's going to be the Holy Spirit, is it not? Well, I think yes. Yes, I think so. I'm not sure exactly how my Hebrew friends see that, but we're seeing already something more surprising maybe. Here's God, and then the Spirit of God is moving over the face of the waters, and there's some kind of creative aspect related to the Spirit of God, not exactly sure. And then God begins to speak, and He speaks, and there's light, and He speaks, and there's ferment, and He speaks, and there's a gathering of the water and the land and the seeds and the birds and the fish, and He speaks, and all of these things happen. Well, now, the Bible, as you know, because we've talked about it many times, the Bible has lots and lots of ways to help us grasp spiritual truth that have to reach into our experience to help us understand it. So, yes, the, the Lord spoke, but as I know speech, and as you know speech, as I'm doing it even right now, speech requires vocal cords, and it requires air to vibrate and to carry the sound waves to fall upon your ear so that you hear it and so that you know that speech has happened. So here's God creating everything, and He's speaking. God said, let there be, and He said, and let there be, and does that mean that God has vocal cords and He needs air to carry the sound? Well, no. I hadn't ever really thought about it that way, but... No, I don't guess God does need vocal cords. The Bible says that He is spirit. We've already seen that image has to mean something other than form and shape and body. So He didn't need vocal cords, and He didn't need air to carry sound, and He didn't need ears to hear the thing. Well, what does God do when He speaks? I don't know. <laughs> He's God. He can do whatever He wants to do when He speaks. Maybe He does sign language. Ha <laughs> ha. So... It's a metaphor, brothers and sisters, that means that God is creating in such a way that it is like a word that forms and moves out and reveals the one who spoke it. That's why in John chapter 1 it says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. As hard and as complex as that little thought is, somehow it's connected back over to Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, where He spoke and all of these things came about. So here's where I'm taking you with these thoughts. In this complexity of the picture of God that you're trying to formulate in your mind, you have got God, and there's just one God, and yet already in these early chapters we're seeing something about the speaking, the revealing, the, the shaping by His Word, and the brooding of the Spirit of God over the face of the waters. And so, 
even though my Jewish friends are not going to say, well, that points to the Trinity, doesn't it? I'm going to say that the original writer very likely did not have the Trinity in his mind at all. But since we're starting in the New Testament and going backwards, I think we're beginning to see something in this majestic God that is really tough to get your mind around. And here's where it is. Now, I don't know any other way to say this except... It's going to be real easy for you to drift right now. <laughs> but I hope you won't. So I think this is really important. And this is what I want to say about all of that. Is that God is. Well, that was easy enough. I haven't drifted yet. God is. Or you could say God am, if you would like. That would be a little more biblical. God is. But as He is in Himself, you would never be able to know Him. He is absolute other. Sort of like if we were all amoebas today. You remember amoebas from middle school biology? These sort of basically flat creatures that just have jelly-like extensions that move around. If you get the wrong one up your nose, you're dead. But here's these little amoebas. They just kind of sit flat. What in the world would an amoeba do looking up at a human being? Well, first thing, they don't have eyes, so they can't look up at a human being. It would be like if they had any kind of perception at all, they might be able to see a little slot of my leg or something. I, You know... They've only got this little thing. I am so other, there would never be a way an amoeba could even begin to imagine me. Now, I know they don't have a brain, so they're not going to be imagining me, but if you would make yourself for just a moment kind of amoeba-like, <laughs> and now try to think from the level of the amoeba to think, oh, well, there's the human being. Think from the level of here is a human to there is God. I know you've always had this big kind of oversized man with a beard and sparks coming out of him somehow as kind of God. And, and as I've said before, that ain't it. That's not him. Somehow in his majesty and his grandeur and in just within the person that who he is, he within the parameters of who he is contains the universe. I don't mean the solar system that we live in, the universe. So if you're going to take something that within the parameters of God can contain within His mind, imagination, whatever, the universe, and you're going to shrink Him down to an oversized man, you haven't, you're not even up to the amoeba level of looking at a person. You will never, ever, ever be able to understand a single thing about who God is as He is if God didn't somehow slow Himself down, I guess, to where we can perceive Him. And yet that's what He wants to do. That's what He constantly does. Within Himself, He is other. He is holy. You will never get it. But He has determined that He will do whatever He needs to do to find ways that you and I and our great limitations can perceive Him. And so... God is always finding this way to come down to our level somewhat. Ultimately, He's going to do it in Jesus. But God is constantly revealing Himself. We will never get the whole thing, but He's constantly revealing Himself in ways that we can catch. And so that's why words like word are used in the Scripture. That's also why a word like Son is used in the Scripture because the Son of God is not something less than God. It's just God making it possible for us to perceive Him. And so we, we find these words that are packed with so much more than you ever put into it 
we, we talk about God as Father in such a way that this is the God who is beyond us, who is other, that we will never be able to catch really much of who He is, but He's always coming to us as Son. He's always coming to us as Word. He's always coming to us in a way that we can perceive. He's slowing Himself down. He's limiting Himself so that we can catch those bits of it. And beyond that, the Spirit was hovering over the face of the waters. Here is the New Testament doctrine that helps us to know that God is Father and He is Son and He is also the one who can not only be above us and with us, He can be in us. In, in, in us. The majestic God who created the vastness of this universe chooses when you submit to Him, to come and dwell inside of you. And when He dwells inside of you, He is Spirit. And all of a sudden, these little shadowy things that we're kind of picking up in Genesis chapter 1 as we move into the New Testament, far beyond this, start to take greater shape that we know Him as Father and we know Him as Son and we know Him as Spirit. We know Him in this kind of Trinitarian language that we use. And so God, this great, wonderful, majestic God who is so much more than we will ever be able to imagine, wants to have a relationship with us. And so He reveals Himself in such a way that he can have a re we can have a relationship with Him. But now, if that one wasn't far enough out there, if you're not looking at the stained glass already, it seems to me like this one takes even, even another pretty big step. And what's very interesting is that just about every theologian I have ever read makes this point and agrees with it. That there is just this one God, and we know as one God. He is one God. There are not three gods. There is one God. There is only one God, and yet God has shown Himself. We've come to know Him as Father and Son and Spirit. We've come to know Him in this Trinitarian kind of way. But that God can be known as Father and Son and Spirit does not mean that there is one God and He expresses Himself in three different kind of modes. That He is Father and that He is Son and that He is Spirit is His eternal nature. That is who He is. And all the theologians agree that one of the things that that means is that the God who is one lives in eternal relationship within Himself. God is already in relationship within Himself. He is in a love relationship. That one blew your mind. You kind of like, where did you just go, Donnie? Well, I, I just went there as Jerry's pastor. But <laughs> that God is in relationship within Himself. He was not lonely. He did not create us because He was lonely. That was a false story you heard as a child. God was not lonely. God has never been lonely. God does not need us. He wants us. God lives within a love relationship within Himself. And many theologians will say that God is in this eternal exploration of his own love relationship with himself. Now that one just went wild right there. I was like, what did you just say? I'm not sure. I read it in a book. But now if that's true, and I believe that it is, as hard as it might be to think about that or to understand that or even try to guess what I was saying there, what that means just about as much as anything else is that relationship is the nature of God. And we find here in these passages, especially in verse 27, that God created humans in the image and likeness of God. Now, we talked a little bit about image and likeness last week. And I know this is kind of, I don't, I don't, I don't know, cerebral. Hang in there with me. It does not need form. That's a false idea. If you can, pitch that one out. Pitch out that image. God does not have this form. He is spirit. But it probably means something about 
communication, we can communicate. And as God, it, it probably means even more about mind. Mind is something more than gray matter. I mean, the psychiatrists know that that is the psycho. They know that that is true. That there's a gray matter in there, but that the sparks can happen between those little cells, and it creates a mind that remembers and looks out into the future and understands stuff and is self-perceptive. And somehow God is kind of like that. And so in His image, mind is part of it. But almost everybody that talks about what it means to be made in the image of God agree that it means that we He made us for relationship. Because He is in relationship with Him. That is His nature. And He made us for relationship. Of course, of course. No, this is more profound than you're thinking. Just keep going. First of all, that we may have relationship with God, that we may live in a relationship like the Creator to His creation, of, of, of obedience to our loving Father. He made us for that relationship. He also made us that we would have relationships with one another. He made us for that. You say, of course He made us for that. Well, do you know that the vast majority of what God made cannot have relationships with other things? Now, if you want to call gravity and energy a relationship, because you know the moon is gravitationally related to the earth, and we're all gravitationally related to the sun, but they don't talk to each other. They don't ever become boyfriend and girlfriend, as much as the ancients like to think about the planets as being somehow sexually related or something. that They're not. And our little solar system runs on, and their solar system runs on. We have a great gravitational relationship, but we can't say, Hey, how are you guys over there? Would you go to the school dance with me? Well, totally. I saw that commercial too. If you haven't seen it, it doesn't make any sense to you. The vast majority of what God made does not relate to other things, but God made us to have a relationship with one another. He built that within His creation he made us to have a relationship with the world, the earth, in a certain kind of way to rule it, to be stewards over it. But He made us for a relationship. And now here's the, here's the next big step I think that this takes. In verse 27, it says, So God created them in His image. In the image of God created He Him. Male and female created He them. So not all theologians pick up on this, but a lot of them do, and I think they're right when they do. Is that what you have there in verse 27 is a little snippet of something we've talked about a lot recently, Hebrew parallelism. You remember that one? So in Hebrew parallelism, it's like a poem where instead of at the end, the words rhyme with one another, one idea rhymes the other idea. And so the first idea in that little couplet is that God created him in his image. And the second idea that says the same thing is male and female, he created them. So whatever else, whatever else it means to be made in the image of God, to be able to communicate, to be able to have relationships, to be able uh, to have a relationship with God, you know, to have mind, all of those things that it can mean and likely does mean to be made in His image, none of those things quite catch the fullness of what this says. He made us in His image, and in doing that, He made us male and female. Well, you've grown up with male and female all of your life to the point that, you know, it's just out there. The animals, male and female. I mean, many of the plants are male and female. The earthworms are, oh well, the earthworms are both male and female in themselves. But there are not many of them like that. It's, that's just the way it is. Well, that is just the way it is because that's just the way God made it to be. It's not surprising that a large part of what God created has some similarities to the completed point of His creation. That the animal kingdom, those things breathe and they have skin and organs and 
all kinds of stuff. It's not surprising that they are similar to, to what God has made in us, but you see the Scripture there in the story leads to verse 20, 26 and 27 where the high point of creation is creating these people in His image. And then He says, when He made us in His image, it was male and female. Whatever else the image of God is going to mean, it's got to mean that. It has to mean that as a male, I reflect something within God Himself. And as a female, she... I, I, I'm not pointing to the whole soprano section, but I mean I could because it's the same true, but I don't know all of them. I, I know that one. She was made just as much in the image of God as what I was made in the image of God. I, I don't know, there's no place else I can go with verse 27. In the image of God, He made them, He made Him, He made them, male and female, there they are. The image of God somehow is reflected in this. Now, I don't think it necessarily means body parts, although... On Sunday morning in the pulpit, you don't talk much about body parts, but I will say, I will say that God made nothing bad. Everything God made was good. And at the very level of physicality, our bodies demonstrate this wonderful magnificence of God where He takes these different things and builds them for relationship that reflect him. Part of where our culture has gone today that saddens me so very much is that they're going to soften or take some of that away. And I don't want them to take that away because that was in the creative pattern of God where here's this male made in the image of God, and here's this female made in the image of God who's in their differences reflect the fullness of God's creativeness. And they show, they show, even down to the body that we have, that He made us for relationship. Because He lives in relationship with himself, and out of that love relationship of God, he created us to reflect the diversity and the unity of God is reflected in the diversity and the unity of human beings. So who we are in our physicality as male and female are good. No evil has come into the world yet, only good. And at the end of this, he says, it's very good. Now, we're able to twist all of God's good creation and make some really bad stuff come out of it. But at this point where we're building foundation, we've got to get this one right. Even to this degree, brothers and sisters, I do not know why God wanted to create the universe. None of us know. That's within the mystery of God. And yet, out of the love, the relationship that was already within God, He created this vast universe <coughs> that we live in. He created life out of stuff that wasn't alive. And He created the ultimate life in humankind for these would be able to relate to God in a way that none other of His creation could do. And then in this diversity of His creation, where He created male and female reflecting His image, He made it so that we could partner with God in the creation of human life. Now, in some sense, there's no way that I create human life. Human life is only because God makes things alive. We do not exist as spirit things somewhere and then we come into a body. That is, that is a false idea. It's not a Christian idea. God takes this man and this woman in this 
unity of relationship and invites them to become partners with Him in creation and new human life comes out of that relationship. And so all of this, all of this reflects the image of God. I don't know where that takes you (laughs) as I try to explore the image of God with you today. I don't know where it takes you, but I hope that it takes you to this spot. God's great desire that springs from His character is that we relate to Him. And He built that so deeply into humankind that to the very level of our bodies we are driven towards relationship with others and the creation of new human life. And that can be divorced or separated from the Creator God. People don't have to acknowledge Him to be able to make babies. But when you and I come to see that God has made us this way to reflect who He is, we come to a different level of understanding of the relationship that God wants us to have with Him. He wants us to have a relationship that partners with Him in every way, that we understand His creative majesty within humankind, and that we participate with God in the creating of new life. And all of this reflects Him. And when we come to God in Christ Jesus, all of the things that were broken by sin that's going to come later starts to become healed. And then we start to see what God is doing in the world. That it's not chance. That we're not here by accident. That we're here by a design of God. And that God has a plan and a drive to draw the world to Himself. The world that has been broken because of our sinful condition. He is working constantly, constantly to heal the break so that we may have relationship with Him. And in a healed relationship with God, we may start to really know how to have relationships with one another. And deepest of all of these human relationships with that man or that woman that God gave me. That's about as big an idea as I know how to talk about. And I know I did not do any kind of justice to it today. But I pray that somehow as I try to fumble around with words and try to put those visual images out there, Somehow or another, God captures your holy imagination and helps you to see you are something far more than you ever thought before. You're a creation of God. And that relationship that you may have with that husband or that with your wife, and by the way, He makes some people complete without that relationship. That's part of His giftedness. But for the normal of us within that husband and wife relationship, which we will explore in another week or two, He invites you into His creative process. And He invites you into the healing process of this broken world in which we live. All of my thoughts are not concluded. We will have to explore chapter 2 and chapter 3 to be able to fill out more of that story. But we're making progress towards it. When you go to the restaurant today after church or home, ask your spouse, what was Brother Donnie saying today? (laughs) And maybe she can explain it to you. I'm hoping she can for me. (laughs) If it sounded grand, even if you didn't understand it, good. You're on track. You're on track. It is grand. 
It's a loving and gracious God who made us and wants us for His own. He offers us every time we gather Himself. And that's why we have an invitation time to respond not so much to what Brother Donnie said, because it's confusing, but to respond to maybe what God said, that voice that you heard in your heart that said, What? He made me that way? He loves me that much? He wants that badly to relate to me? He wants so much for me to have relationships in this world that are meaningful and right, and above all, to have a relationship with Him that's meaningful and right? Yes. That's what the whole cross story is about. That's what He did to heal the break that came after the perfect creation. Maybe today, as we've talked about God's Word and sung these songs, God has spoken to you in some way, and there's some kind of decision you need to share with this church body. We invite you to do that while we sing. Those who might need to profess faith in Christ, those who want to join as part of this church, someone who says, man, if that's what God wants, I want to be a part of telling this story to the world, and He may call you into some kind of... He may call you to Africa or someplace else, Angela. Or He may call you to the community of Jasper to share Jesus right here. Whatever the decision the Lord might lay on your heart today, while we sing together, I will be here at the front. I invite you to come and join me. And we'll talk about it and pray about it and seek the Lord together. Would you do that? Let's all stand as we sing this, our invitation song. Thank you.
Would you be seated for a moment, please? Uh, I'd like to share with you this morning a young man who has come to walk along in faith with us here at First Baptist Church. This is Camden Coker. Uh, Camden became a believer a couple of years ago at camp, but he's been a part of our youth group, and Jim has been a mentor and a friend to him for quite some while. He's really been involved this summer going to MFUGE and helping at VBS, and I, you were on the rec staff at, at Kids Camp too, were you? W did not do that one. Okay. Well, you can take a shot at that next year. <laughs> but uh, he has come today uh, letting you know that he is a follower of Christ, but he wants to be baptized in obedience to the Lord and become a member of this church, serving the Lord alongside of us in this community, sharing this God who loves us with the community around us. So would you stand up here with me for a minute? Jim, would you come and stand beside him? This is Camden. Um, the way we do it in Baptist life is that we vote on receiving new members. As you know, our vote has absolutely nothing to do with a person's right relationship with God. We have no vote in that. That happens between Camden when he trusts the Lord as his Savior and as he grows in Christ. Our vote means we want you to be a part of this body to serve Christ alongside of us. And it's not just a vote, it's a pledge. It's a pledge that we will love you and pray for you and encourage you in the faith. And we will help you walk this walk. We will help you walk this walk. We won't watch it. We will help you walk this walk. So if you're in favor of receiving Camden as a member in this church, would you say aye? Aye. And of course, there is no no's. Great. Um, go ahead and have a seat. Jim's got an announcement or two to make. And then you come by and welcome this young man into the membership of this church. We'll work out a date before too long when he can be baptized. All right, Jim. All right, church, before we dismiss, just want to share with you, we all have invited all of our VBS attendees and their families back tonight at 5 p.m. to share what exactly it was that we were doing at Destination Dig. We want to share all the music uh, with the parents, and we want you guys to come, too. And uh, just we're going to have good fellowship afterwards and have some ice cream sundaes. So it's going to be a really fun time. It's going to be from 5 to 6 this evening. And uh, like I said, after we're done, we're going to go into the gym and, uh, and I'll eat some ice cream together. A lot of the kids are very excited about that. Uh, my two little ones have been asking, when's the ice cream? When's the ice cream? Like, it's tonight. <laughs> Most certainly. Most certainly. Uh, Wednesday, we've got normal activities. The children are meeting in the gym from 6 to 7. The youth will be here uh, in the youth room from 6 to 7. We've got ladies Bible study going on in the computer lab at 6 as well. And as always, we've, we're meeting in here for, for prayer meeting and Bible study in the sanctuary. That's all from 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock. And then next Sunday is 4th of July. So it's going to be normal service, but afterwards, everyone's invited to stay afterwards for lunch. Uh, I believe, are we doing cheeseburgers? And, is that what we're doing? I'm not sure what we're doing. Cheeseburgers. And homemade ice cream. Man, ice cream two Sundays in a row. God is good. So, we, uh, so we're just going to have a good time. So we want to invite you back and, and uh, just invite you to stick around and, and fellowship. It's been a while since we've sat down and actually had a meal together. It's been, it's been, a, it's been a different kind of year, but uh, we're going to start doing these fellowships more often. So thank you so much for being here. I do want to remind you after we're done, come, come down here and, and introduce yourself to Camden. He's a, he's a real talker, and so he's got a lot to say. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Asked him if he had a speech prepared this morning. I got a little nervous. But now come, come, down and, come down and introduce yourself. Camden's a great guy. Would you stand and let's sing once again. Bow down before you. Bow down before you. Yeah. 